reason I'm doing this is, interestingly, I'm doing a tour. I did, um, I did Zambia, I, I did Blantar, I did uh, Tanzania, I did Kenya, and it's called Wakanda for Laughter. It's called Wakanda for Laughter. Now, that's not what is going to be online because Disney will sue me, right? <laughs> but pretty much the idea was whenever Black Panther came out, right, a lot of like, white people get very excited about Africa. And they approach me saying, oh, you're from Wakanda, Wakanda, Wakanda. And I'm like, okay, Malawi, a little east of Wakanda. But you know what I mean? <laughs> Malawi is between Wakanda and Zarmunda. That's, that's, <laughs> that's what we're doing, right? But people have got like a strange idea of Africa, yeah. right? And I've always felt this. Like people, they come excited, but they want it to be like some fantasy version with like lions strolling the streets. And like, it's funny when people say that, but some of the stuff people say is actually quite offensive. Like I had a woman approach me and she was like very angry. And she was like, oh, you're African? Like, yeah, yeah. She was like, I don't like how you circumcise your women. And I was like, you know, I've, I've never done that. I, I, don't know. I don't know what you think I do on the weekend to entertain myself, but that's, that's not my thing. She just kept going, it's disgusting, it's barbaric how you circumcise your women. So I, I got angry, I cut her clitoris off, I did. I'm kidding, I'm a man, I couldn't find it. <laughs> You gotta know, like, my jokes are very close to the edge, so. <laughs> I know there are lots of lights, so you're afraid, because what happens when it's dark is people can laugh loudly, but when they're lights, people are like <coughs> <laughs> Don't worry, don't worry, it's all in the spirit of fun, it's all in the spirit of fun. And so what I decided to do, what I wanted to do, is I've always wanted to do a thing called Lafrica, right? Which the idea is, it's jokes about every country in Africa. So, on the one hand, it's being funny, but it's also being a bit educational and also making them realize that Malawian problems aren't necessarily the same as Nigerian problems and like, you know, uh, Cameroon's a real place and like, because like, you know, when it comes to television, I don't know how, somehow Kenya and South Africa have got the monopoly. Like, if you see Africa, it's either like Lion King or it's like some Zulu warrior running around and like, there's, there's, other, there's other bits of Africa. Now I pitched it to, to Netflix, they said no. Okay, I pitched it to Amazon, they said it's too expensive. And I, I got frustrated because, but I will admit, the version I wanted was traveling to every African country and doing jokes in every African country. Very big budget. But I, now that Black Panther 2 was coming around, and I was like, I've still not done it, I was like, I should just start doing it, right? And I'm going to film a bunch of jokes about every country in Africa, and then I'm going to start putting them up on the internet every week probably three or four uh, a, a, a week, and that's, that's what we're, we're doing here. So thank you. <laughs> Welcome to Africa. This is a show where you hear jokes about Africa, the real Africa, not Wakanda, not Zarmunda, the real Africa. Every week, I'm going to tell you a joke about a few countries in Africa, and I hope you enjoy them. So, I am recording this in Malawi. <laughs> of course, of course we start with Malawi because I am a Malawian. Malawi is a very, very small country uh, and uh, we are known as the warm heart of Africa. Does anyone, does anyone know who gave us this name? How did we become the warm heart? Because African countries all just claim something. Like Kenya just decided they're the pride. I, I didn't say they're my pride. No. Like they just decided, who decided we're the warm heart? I suppose it's because when people visit, they leave and say, oh, everybody's warm, everyone's happy. Is this, is this accurate? Yes. Clap your hands if you feel we deserve it. Yes. Clap your hands if you're like, no, I've met too many cold-hearted people. No. Just, just cue, you're, you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right, right. But it's a very beautiful country. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful country to be here. Uh, we've got, uh, I am not actually the biggest celebrity in Malawi. I, I wish I was the biggest celebrity. The biggest celebrity, I think, is our prophet. Yes. Yes. The shepherd Bushiri, yes. otherwise known as Major One. Major yes. One. And I will always tell you, man, I, 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 he gives me hope. Right? He gives me hope because those of you watching might not know this, but prophet Bushiri had a huge career outside Malawi. Yes. Right? He was doing big like, I, I was about to call them shows. 
it's the same thing. It's, it's like comedy, but, but it moves people. Like he, he, was doing, he was preaching in South Africa. He was very well known. And then he got in trouble. He was accused of money laundering and fraud, and he was going to be put on trial, and then he disappeared. <laughs> like Kaiser Shose, he just, he just disappeared. South Africans don't know how he left the country. They're like, was he smuggled in a plane? I don't know what, what he was, he, he somehow left. But what I love is Malawi, even though now he was tainted with scandal, embraced him open arms. No question asked, you are one of us, you are welcome. Now, I'm not saying that I'm doing fraud in England. <laughs> but it's very reassuring to know that if I ever have to run, my lines will come over, come over. And on the way out of the airport, my face will be there, like first thing you see. <laughs> and because Bushiri now is, is based here, there's a lot of religious tourism. Like people fly in to see what he's up to. It's absolutely amazing. People fly in, but religious tourists, they aren't the same as other tourists. When they come in through customs and they say, do you have anything to declare? They're like, our sins. <laughs> uh -huh. There are a lot of scandals here, though. A lot of scandals. A lot of corruption sometimes, a lot of scandals, like they're, they're arresting everybody. Like as I'm filming right now, a few weeks ago, they, they, they like arrested the head of the anti-corruption bureau. Like literally, like everyone's getting arrested, but everyone's getting arrested, like the vice president got arrested. It's getting to the point that more people have been arrested than not. And I think if you haven't been arrested, when you show up at like the local party, you're gonna be the one left out. They're gonna be like, oh, I was arrested, I was arrested. <laughs> Oh, I was arrested, like, my father was arrested two days, not one, not one, it's re it's re but all of the scandals are about, like, like, farming, honestly, so, like, right now, we had a fertilizer scandal, right, then we, there was a maize scandal, then there was, like, like, you know, a generator scandal, <laughs> and I'll tell you one story, which isn't funny, but it's very interesting, um, like, I was contacted by a charity who wanted to make a film about Malawi, they wanted to make a, a film about the Chilembwe uprising. Now, for those of you who don't know, we were a, a, a colony of the British, and one of the early uprising was led by Chilembwe, who was a, a, a preacher. And so somebody who was like, oh, this is interesting. Malawi has their own Martin Luther King. Let's make a movie, okay? And so they approached me. I don't think they'd done the research. And they were like, can you write about Chilembwe? And I was like, of course, I'll write about Chilembwe. So I, I wrote, and then they read, and they were like, wait, wait, someone was decapitated. Because <laughs> literally, I don't know if any of you know this, like literally when they, they were serious business, they were serious, when they got angry at the landowners, they, they chopped one of their heads off. And when I wrote this, they thought I was like Karen, Tarantino wannabe or something like this. I was like, what's this? I was like, this is history. This is what happened. And that was the last they ever contacted me. <laughs> <laughs> I think they wanted the Disney movie version of what happened. So that is Malawi. That is Malawi. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Now, Zambia has a lot in common with Malawi, a lot in common, similar languages. In fact, I, I was recently in Zambia and I realized that Zambians are just Malawians with money. <laughs> 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 I'm being booed, but it's true. It's true. They are exactly like us, but like, you know, there's a little less load shedding. There's, you know, just a little less. Oh, actually, you know, I was trying to even think, when I was thinking about Wakanda, I was trying to think what Malawian superheroes would be. And I was thinking we would have a guy with electric powers, but they only work a few hours a day. <laughs> So Zambia is wonderful, like Zambia is wonderful. Um, now, Zambia has caused me a lot of problems on social media. Because I was born in Zambia, okay, essentially what happened was my parents uh, were, were in exile because Malawi had a, a, a dictator, Kumuzu Banda, so they moved to Zambia where I was born. So because I was born in Zambia, my name is spelt D-A-L-I-S-O, which is the Zambian version. The Malawian version is D-A-L-I-T-S-O. I didn't know that 
this tea could cause so much trouble. <laughs> like literally, there's not a day that goes by without a Malawian saying, you're not saying your name right. <laughs> you're spelling it wrong, like cursing me, saying, oh, whatever. No, 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 that is why there's no tea, right? It's a, it's a soft little thing. It's a, a wonderful country. Uh, a few funny things, okay? So the first funny thing is they have their own prophet, like uh, Zambia has their own prophet, not as, as, as lauded as Bushiri, but what happened was Prophet Benjamin got caught up in some scandals. And his response was not to disappear like Bushiri. No, instead what he did was he said, you know what, I'm stopping being a prophet. But I'm like, how can you stop being a prophet? When the angel shows up, do you say, sorry, wrong number? <laughs> what <do you> know? <laughs> it's for life. You can't stop being a prophet, but it, it, the very ambitious nation with lots of interesting things would happen. And my favorite thing that they ever had was in 1997, there was a coup attempt. It was a failed coup attempt, but the reason it was failed was because the people, the soldiers were drunk. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how this starts, it's a bunch of drunk soldiers, they're like, we should take over the country! <laughs> But that's not what you're meant to do when you get drunk, you know what I mean? You're meant to wake up the next day with a hangover. You're not meant to get hanged for treason. No. You're meant to take a few shots. You're not meant to actually take shots. I've, I've got a lot of these. I've got a lot of these. You're meant to get tanked. You're not meant to get in a tank. <laughs> we have a crazy story. I don't even know if I can remember all of this, but there was a guy, okay. So Zambia has the originator of Africa's first space program. Oh. Yes. His name was Edward Coloso. And what he did was when the, the Americans and the Russians were trying to go to space, he decided Zambia's going to go first. Oh. And he just built his own rocket. He started training local astronauts by putting them, you know how he got them ready for zero gravity? He put them in ba barrels and rolled the barrels. <laughs> Unfortunately, he was beaten by the Americans and the Russians, but I, I think it actually is the spirit of Africa, right? We're very ambitious, even if we don't have the money to do it, even if we don't really know what we're doing, but our heart is in the right place. <laughs> talk about Kenya. Ladies and gentlemen, I actually went to primary school in Kenya. I went to a place called Kenton College. It was a very posh British school, right? More British than England. It, a lot of it didn't make sense. Like literally at Kenton, did you go to a British school as well? In which, which country? In Malawi. In Malawi, which one? KA. You went to KA actually, actually. Kamuza Academy. Right, right, right. Huh? The Eton of Africa. Okay, so which is better, St. Andrews or Kamuzu? Okay, wait, we have to remove people who actually went there. So people who did not go to Kamuzu or St. Andrews, you have to vote. Okay, St. Andrews? We've got your... Kamuzu? It's like a 50-50 split. Well, Kenton College, very similar, right? So it was a British school in Kenya. Right, they were trying to recreate Britain, but things like we used to wear a uniform, which was like exactly what they wear in Kenton in England. So it was like thick blazers, but it was, we were near the equator, so we were falling off, sweating in our blazers, but you look how you're meant to look. It's really funny, and we didn't learn, we didn't learn Swahili. We didn't learn the Kenyan national language of Swahili. Instead, they taught us English, French, Latin. I learned more Swahili from the Lion King than I did from my British school in Kenya. I'm a bow, I'm a bus, I'm a bus. Waste of time. Why, why do I know Latin? It's really ridiculous. But then also, I will say this, like uh, history class, no Kenyan history. No Jomo Kenyatta, no Mau Mau rebels, no, they taught us Henry VIII, William the Conqueror. And then when I moved to the UK, I heard people saying, why do all these immigrants come here? You prepared me. <laughs> they taught me, where did they think I was going to go? 
<laughs> they should have taught me Japanese if they didn't want me there. But of course, the time of the year when everybody is Kenyan is during the Olympics. I don't care what country you're from, during the Olympics, I am Kenyan. I, yeah. Because they represent, they represent all of Africa. My favorite Kenyan athlete is Julius Yego. He, if you don't know Julius Yego, he is a self-taught javelin thrower. So what he did was he just watched lots of YouTube videos, started practicing throwing the javelin until he became brilliant, Olympic level, just from watching videos. I must be amazing at sex. <laughs> Olympic, Olympic level, o Olympic, Olympic level. <laughs> the thing they did with me not teaching Swahili, it's actually softer than what it was initially. Because at the beginning of the colonial period, what they would actually do is they would force you to not speak your language at school, right? Yes, here as well. And then if you were caught speaking your language, they would, they would punish you, right? So one of the things they would do is they would make you wear something on the back. Yes, vernacular speaker. They did the same thing here. Did you, did you, have, did you have vernacular speaker on your back? But this, I thought this was like in the 60s. They still are doing this. They still do this. Do they still do this in Malawi? Not at KA. Not at KA. At St. Andrews. <laughs>We are going to go talk about Eswatini. Eswatini. I'm starting with all of the countries which I have a personal connection to. So I actually went to school in Eswatini. At the time, it was called Swaziland. Swaziland. Now, some of you may be watching, wondering, why did this country change its name? So at the time, the country was going through a lot of problems. There were people demonstrating. There were people frustrated at the poverty and the king thought everybody's calling for change, so he changed the name. <laughs> no, so, so Eswatini is one of the last countries which has a, a, a king, and a king with actual power. I'm sorry if you're watching King Charles. <laughs> but there are other kings who actually can legislate. Yes. I don't know why I'm making fun of, of King Charles. I live in England. They're going to revoke my British citizenship and say, oh, go back to Malawi, funny man. Okay, but here we go, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I, another interesting fact, another interesting fact about um, the king of Swaziland, who is King Muswati, is that he has 15 wives. How do you retain your sanity <laughs> with 15 wives? Who's married? Clap your hands, married people. Yeah. Married people. Could you imagine two husbands? Could you imagine? Oh, wait, you imagine oh, 15, 15. Could you imagine? Also, how do you retain the magic when you've got 15 wives? How do you even give them a compliment? You are the 15th most beautiful woman in the world. Do you have a rotation, a calendar next to the bed? Yeah. Oh, sorry, you're the 14th. She's a... <laughs> Also, the king of Swaziland has 36 children. Keep trying, Nick Cannon. You'll get there. <laughs> oh, I do not have any children. Uh, I don't have any children. Uh, I, 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 but I'm at that age in my life where everyone I date has children. Like, literally. I've realized that I'm no longer capable of picking up, like, you know, the, the young... <laughs> The young 20-year-old type women. No, no, no. Now I, I know my demographic is divorced. <laughs> like, 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 divorced single mother. That's, that's everyone, everyone I, who has reciprocal interest. But I'm not complaining. I like this pocket because it's very easy. Because I, I didn't realize. It's women who had a hard time and they just want someone to make them laugh. And that, I can do that. I can do that. <laughs> I can do that. No problem. 
and I don't even have to buy them diamonds. I don't have to do anything. I just have to tell jokes about how rubbish their ex was. That's it. That's it. I'm done. I'm done. They're like, oh my God, you're so beautiful. <laughs> There's a story which I don't know, I wish I, I should, actually, I won't tell that story. Actually, I'll tell it for you. I don't think I'll air it. But like, I went to school. I went to school in Swaziland. And the king came to our school to give a speech when Queen Noor of Jordan, right, who was, were you there? You were there. So, oh, I, I don't know if you remember this. So Queen Noor of Jordan was one of the chair people of the United World Colleges. And the school I was going to was that. And so Queen Noor of Jordan came to our school with King Muswati, and she gave a speech. And it was a beautiful speech. It was eloquent. All of us were moved. It was amazing. And I don't know why Muswati decided he must speak after her. <laughs> and it hurt as uh, like Africans, like literally, literally he came on and he started going, um, um, and oh, no, also, you're like, no, why are you doing this? Now, those of you watching may not be able to remember this, but like every African remembers when this happened again, which was Nelson Mandela's funeral. Oh, yeah. And at the memorial, we had Barack Obama come and give, like even for Barack Obama, it was a good speech. Yeah. Like he literally memorialized. And then Jacob Zuma of South <laughs> Africa came out. Eh. <laughs> Uh, and what you've got to understand, it's very hard as an African to see Africans fail on television. Like, literally, it's like you're watching a horror movie. You want to hide, which is why I just hope that Malawian politicians just stop doing hard talk, okay? <laughs> There's a show on the BBC, Hard Talk. It never goes well, okay? We had a vice president go. It was terrible. We had the current president, Chakwera, go, and it was terrible. Right? And I was watching it, and I was like, just don't answer! Just don't answer! Like, like hard talk has offered me, and I've said, I'm, I'm not talking to you, bastard. I'm not talking. <laughs> and the biggest thing is they asked him about, uh, he, he promised a million jobs. Right? And they were like, uh, why didn't you create these million jobs? And they were really hard on him, but I feel bad for him, because he could have created a million jobs if he had a million family members. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, this is going to be airing online. <laughs> they're, not, they're not filming you. You won't get in trouble for laughing at that joke. You won't get in trouble. You won't get in trouble. <laughs>
It's the myth of Sisyphus, right? So there's a Greek myth of a guy who's got a boulder and he pushes it to the top of a hill and then it rolls down. And then he goes and he pushes this back up. And I don't think this is an accurate metaphor for life. My life is not pushing a boulder up a hill and falling down to the side. It is, however, an accurate metaphor for marriage. <laughs> there are too many married people to laugh at that joke. But that joke is exquisite. I don't care, I don't care who you are. I don't care who you are. So, Angola. Yeah. Do we have fans of Angola in the room? Fans of Angola in the room? You have friends in Angola? I will say that when I was in high school, I was not very happy with the Angolans because uh, there is a very sensual dance called Zouk, which is mainly found in Angola and Mozambique. And I remember in high school, the Mozambican guys and the Angolan guys would, would, would call your girlfriend over <laughs> and be like, let me teach you some moves. And these guys, I'm telling you, like, lo think of any sexy dance. Like, this, this is sexier than Patrick Swayze at his best. Like, this is, this is literally sexier than Lombarda than everything, and they're holding her close, and they're doing all of the moves, and you can't be jealous. Because if you're jealous, she's like, he's just dancing. He's just dancing. And you're like, come on, this is a bit more than dancing. Like, he's holding her close, and he's dipping her back and forth. like, stop being jealous, Deniso. And then the next week, she's pregnant, and she's like, don't be jealous. <laughs> but the Angolans, the Angolans were previously, before it was called Angolan, uh, it was, uh, there was the Mbundu people, the Mbundu people uh, in that area. And one of the most inspiring people was Queen Nzinga, Queen Nzinga, right? And this was absolutely amazing because she fought the Portuguese who eventually colonized Angola, but she fought for 30 years, right? She outfoxed them. She used to arrange surprise attacks. She would make pacts with their enemies and she managed to hold out for 30 years. But the most hilarious thing that Queen Zinga did is at one point she had a meeting with the Portuguese and she walks in and she notices that they are sitting and there are no seats. And it's like a power move on them. They want to be like, we are sitting comfortable, you have to talk to us. And she was like, no way this is going to happen, right? We are equals. So she made one of the people, one of her assistants, get down on all fours, and she sat on him, right? And so she could talk to them as equal. And I'm sure after that, he was able to, you know, update his CV <laughs> and say, now I'm also a chairperson. <laughs> oh, but also an interesting thing about Lunanda. Lunanda in, uh, in Angola is actually the most expensive city in the world for expatriates. Right, most expensive. So like you can buy jeans for $250, like a two bedroom flat is $6,500. It's extremely expensive, but they've also got a rule. Well, they used to have a rule in 2014, I don't know if it's still current, but they had a rule where you weren't allowed to take any of the Kwanzaa, which is the Angolan currency, out of the country. But I'm like, at those prices, you've got no money left anyway. <laughs> Entirely unnecessary. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, next up we've got Benin. Benin. So Benin is actually currently in the news a lot because of the Benin bronzes. The Benin bronzes are artifacts from Benin which were beautiful, exquisitely carved, which have ended up because of the British looting in lots of British uh, museums, museums in America, and so on and so forth. And I actually did a project with the World Museum in Liverpool. So what happened was, in my radio show, I made a joke about the uh, slavery museum, because there's a slavery museum in Liverpool. It's, it, they're very well-meaning, but there's stuff in there that didn't make sense, right? Like, I was walking around, and they, after all the things you expect, 
like chains and whips and stuff. They had a wall where they just put pictures of random black people. Famous black people, nothing to do with slavery. Like Barack Obama's on the wall. <laughs> I don't know why he was on the wall, but I guess he's made speeches about slavery, but Jay-Z is on the wall. Why is the rapper? <laughs> he got 99 problems. Slavery is not one of them. <laughs> Right, and also most ridiculous thing is on the way out, they've got a gift shop. What are you meant to buy at the slave gift shop? <laughs> like human beings? I was like, this is unacceptable. But they told me the British government has made a lot of cuts. So in order to make ends meet, they have to buy stuff. So to support them, I bought a little tote bag, a Liverpool Slavery Museum tote bag, right? But on my way out, I noticed it said 100% cotton. Oh. They're taking the piss. <laughs> no, but anyway, so after I did this, I got contacted by the World Museum, and they were like, you can make jokes about this thing, but why don't you work with us to doing better? So I worked with them for a year, and we made a, 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 an African culture uh, exhibit talking about all of the African cultures there, but also being very open about how they ended up with some of the artifacts, particularly the Benin bronzes. And what's complicated is people always think it's straight up like they were stolen. But actually things get there in three ways, right? So some of the bronzes were bought, right? So the ones which were bought, there's no guilt. You can look at that carving, right? Some of them were looted, right? And that is horrible. But then there's the mix, the, the in between, because a lot of them were gifts. Now, the problem is the British would show up with like guns and weapons and then get a lot of gifts. Yeah. Now, I don't know how much of a gif gift this is. Like, if I showed up at your house <laughs> with an AK-47, yeah. and I'm like, what a lovely plasma screen you have. <laughs> and you're like, here, take it. It's a gift. <laughs> how much of a gift is it? <laughs> but there's a lot of controversy, because a lot of people disagree about what should be done, because some people from Benin are like, we want them back. Other people are like, well, in the British Museum, thousands of people are watching it every day and they are appreciating our culture. If they come back home, nobody will be looking at them other than locals who've got lots of... Like, so there's a lot of arguing. I think the middle ground is, is obvious. Keep them, but pay us. Yes. Give us the money! Yes. <laughs>this week we have got Botswana. Yeah. Now Botswana is one of the countries that Africans hold up when people have stereotypes about Africa being unstable, being war-torn. Actually, Botswana, it's been very stable, uh, very, whole, very robust economy, but there was one big scandal. A big scandal for a very long time where people talked about it all the time. It was in the newspaper every time because the first president of Botswana was in an interracial marriage. So Seretse Kama was married to Ruth Kama, right? Who was a white woman and a lot of people very upset. Now I, I, I legitimately feel for Seretse because I once brought a white woman home. <laughs> and to be fair, I should have, I, I, I just surprised I just surprised my family. I should have, I should have brought a mixed race woman first. Get them used to the idea or just, or just a light skinned woman. And then brought them, but I literally surprised them. Bam, here you go. And to make it work, I brought one covered in tattoos. What, the, what was I doing? What was I doing? What was I doing? What was I doing? And to be fair, actually, my parents were very, my parents didn't have a problem, but my parents have traveled and worked all around the world. It was actually my extended family. It was, it was the uncles in the village. It was the, and I, I still remember one uncle telling me that you, uh, uh, this, this won't work. She will divorce you. Yeah. And she will take half your money. At the time, she made more money than me. So I was like, uh, if we just split, I think I win. I think I win. I think, I think we're, we're, we're fine. I'm a comedian. She's a lawyer. I think I, I, think I win. <laughs> right? No, but it was really 
horrible the things which he was saying. He was saying all kinds of horrible racist things, and I was very frustrated. And I remember thinking, I'm going to prove him wrong. Right? I'm going to prove him wrong. Our relationship is going to last forever. Mm. Right? And I'm going to show him that all of his racist, like backward ideas about interracial relationships are wrong. We are going to stay to show interracial re- unity is real. And then three months later, she broke up with me. And I remember sitting her down and saying, what are you doing? You can't break up with me. We have to stay together to show, to show the world that interracial relationships are possible. We have to show that there is unity. You know, like, 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 like you remember that song? Ebony and Ivory. Come on, we, we can do it. And she said, you cheated on me five times. <laughs> With white women, though. No. <laughs> Next up, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are going to talk about Zimbabwe. Woo! Zimbabwe. Beautiful country. Now, those of you watching probably know me from Britain's Got Talent. Uh, a lot of people don't understand that initially, before Britain's Got Talent, I wanted to go on Zimbabwe's Got Talent until I found out that every year, no matter how many people voted, Robert Mugabe won every year. (laughs) Now, Zimbabwe is a beautiful country, but it has had a very troubled history, in fact. Uh, Even after Robert Mugabe left, things uh, things haven't sorted out. One of the things that amused me to no end, though, is when Robert Mugabe was kicked out by the military. Is everything okay? What's the beat? Oh, that's just an animal. Oh, it's a frog heckling me. <laughs> oh, it's the ghost of Mugabe. That's what it is. <laughs> like, oh, I'll come get you. <laughs> if you see a, 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 a frog with a Hitler mustache, run! <laughs> Mugabe was crazy. He's the only guy who kept the Hitler mustache in fashion. But anyway, uh, when Mugabe was kicked out by the military, they actually came on all of our televisions to say, this is not a coup. And I was watching television like, it looks a bit like a coup. Like, <laughs> there are tanks going down the high street. Like, how is this not a coup? <laughs> like, what, is it a Christmas parade? And later Santa Claus is coming down with an AK-47. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. But one of the, the things which has continued to plague Zimbabwe is they had total currency collapse. Total currency collapse. So there's no Zimbabwean dollar. Nowadays, they use a mix of whatever you can find. You can pay with like uh, dollars, rand, not Malawi kwacha. They're not that desperate. But still. (laughs) But whatever you can get, they, 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 they give it to you, right? But around eight years ago, universities started saying that you could pay the university tuition with livestock. There was no money, so they'd accept a barter. Like, you know, you're, you're, you're studying, like, medi- like, like what, what did you study? Medicine. You studied medicine. It could be like, okay, here is three goats. Hey, here you go. You, you study, what did you study? Business. Business, okay. It's like uh, one goat, but you sell it. <laughs> you sell it for three. That, that's it. You, you upscale, and what did you study? Psychology. Psychology. <laughs> you have no goats, but you say, imagine a goat. <laughs> <laughs> oh. But honestly, honestly, you could pay with goats and cows, which must mean at least once some father had to say to their child, I'm sorry, you can't go to university. Your tuition has foot and mouth disease. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Delisa Papanda here. I hope you're enjoying the jokes. You are getting these jokes for free. So please, to show your appreciation, click subscribe, share, and otherwise spread word of my genius. Next up, ladies and gentlemen, one of the most beautiful countries, one of the most beautiful countries in Africa, Mauritius. Clap your hands if you have been to Mauritius. You've got to go. Gorgeous beaches, gorgeous beaches. Abs- like the entire uh, in- industry is based around tourism. So they, they, they take care of you. It's absolutely wonderful. But I discovered accidentally 
that you cannot go to Mauritius unless you plan to propose. If you take a girlfriend and you do not plan to propose, you are teasing her. It's totally unacceptable what you're doing. It's totally unacceptable because because I was dating this woman and I was like, my brother was like, oh, uh, you know, Mauritius is amazing. So I say, oh, let's go on holiday to Mauritius. We got on the plane, we arrive. We are met by people singing and they come and they put like rings of flowers around us, right? We go to the hotel and this is where I'm like, oh, things are getting a problem. Like everything is flowers and, and candles. We go into the room, they've put our names in flowers on the bed and you could see that she was like, oh my God. It's happening! It's finally happening! <laughs> and I had told her many times I don't want to settle down, but she was like, look at the evidence! Look at the evidence! And it was just day after day. She was always on edge. She was always ready. Like, if I went to the bathroom, he's like, oh, he's going to get it, he's going to get it. At one point, I literally, like, I went on my knee to tie my laces, and she was like, yes! Beautiful country, but please, married people only, <laughs> or if you plan to be married. Yes. <laughs> One more, ladies and gentlemen, speaking of marriage, speaking of marriage, we are going to go to South Sudan, South Sudan, and we are going to talk about the Lakuta tribe, the Lakuta tribe. Now, they have a very interesting practice. Now, I'm not sure if it's a historical practice or if it is still practiced, but what you would do if you were a man and you were attracted to a young woman is you would kidnap her. Oh, yeah. Yes, you would kidnap, oh, you know about this, or are you just reminiscing? You're like, oh. <laughs> but you would kidnap the object of your desire, and then it is the responsibility of her parents and her brothers, her extended family, to come to you and negotiate what the marriage would be. And I just wondered, do you film the kidnapping? Is that like a, a home video for when you're old and you can just put it on and be like, do you remember when I snuck up behind you with a rock and just whacked you? Oh, it's so beautiful. Okay, uh, people are more depressed than amused by... Uh, <laughs> it's not that I would use this method. I would not use it. Is this a couple? Is this a couple over here? How long have you two been together? Three years. Three years, and what was your first date? What, what did you do? We had lunch. They had lunch? Where did you have lunch? Salt and pepper. Blanta. Salt and pepper, Blanta. Nice. But imagine he just came at you with a rock. <laughs> that showed he's a real man. <laughs> Ethiopia. Now, Ethiopia is actually one of the few countries in Africa which was not colonized, right? Uh, they were almost colonized. Uh, at first, the, it, the Italians, the Italians uh, came over and were trying to colonize it and were doing really sneaky things. Like, they had a treaty of Wichale with the Italians, and what they did was they made two versions of the document, one in Amharic, the Ethiopian language, and one in Italian. And what they did is they snuck in different things on the Italian document so that the Ethiopians signed away their land. Right? It was really cheeky, really terrible stuff. It's like, I, I, I actually think I should start doing this when I am hired for shows. I have the English one, and then I also have like the Chichewa one, which I make them sign, which says you, I get 100% of the profit. <laughs> but either way, they didn't sit idly for this. They fought, they battled, and they never actually were colonized, which is very, very inspiring, very inspiring. Now, I actually worked, I, I did an internship in, uh, in Ethiopia. I did it, uh, I was in ADF 2000, African Development Forum 2000, about AIDS, and I think it is possible that I was cursed. So let me explain what happened. So in ADF 2000, they came up with a great idea came with a great idea. They realized teaching AIDS education to all of the villages is very difficult. Because when you go and start talking about sex, everyone leaves. But they realized the people who are able to talk about sex in the villages is the traditional healers. Right? Because people are used to them 
talking about these things if you've got a rash they're who you go to and they will you know do something like so people like so they, they're like why don't we get these guys teach them the aids education and then they will pass it on but the only problem is until this point they had been disrespecting these guys they've been calling them witch doctors calling them crackpots saying they're fakes and now suddenly they needed their help so the the, the, the healers were like okay we will help you but we want to talk first so i was working at adf 2000 i was working for the newspaper and one of the healers showed up right and he was like hey i want you to publish this and he'd written this thing castigating all of the white like who and all of the, the the people for calling them crackpots saying oh you don't you, now you suddenly need our wisdom huh but but you you've never respected us wrote this thing but it was written in very bad english right because it was probably his third language so i look at it and i was like oh this is great and i started fixing it and he was like you what are you doing you're changing my words i was like no no like I'm helping, I'm fixing it. And he was like, you are a small boy, you think you can help, you can fix me. He grabbed it and he fled, and I think I was cursed that day, because I've needed Viagra ever since. <laughs> <laughs>
I would just pay a look alike. <laughs> 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 no, it's very, very smart. Ah, future president. <laughs> now, oh, I've got a British audience. Okay, so to anybody who is in Britain, you may be aware that the Tory government came up with a truly bizarre idea of sending asylum seekers who come to the UK to Rwanda, right? So people literally flee a war zone, arrive in the UK, and it's like, we don't want you, here we go, right? They just re send them to Rwanda. Rwanda is an amazing place. It's not about Rwanda, it's about the idea of not living up to like international agreements of sheltering people. And I think it's based on arrogance. It's based on the fact that English people think they will never be refugees. Yeah. It can happen to everyone. Yeah. When I was born, we were refugees. I came out, I didn't, I didn't do anything. Like literally, like I was meant to be seeking breast milk, but I was seeking asylum. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like we, we didn't do anything, like literally, Nobody chooses this. Nobody chooses this. And, 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 and English people, you need to be worried because you think you're never going to be refugees, but one day the Welsh are going to have enough. <laughs> and when they storm, when hordes of Welsh people storm London, you're going to have to run to like somewhere like Germany and they'll be like, go to Rwanda. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody chooses it. Nobody chooses it, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to Uganda. Next up is Uganda, ladies and gentlemen. One of our neighbors, uh, uh, my father actually went to Uganda to study early in his life. Uganda's got some hilarious stuff going on. Uh, Uganda, for any of the British, British people watching, you had in 2022 three times as many leaders as Uganda's had for the last 20 years. <laughs> like, like, <laughs> <laughs> Museveni is the last man standing. <laughs> Gaddafi is gone. Uh, Mugabe is gone, but like Museveni is like, I'm not going. I'm just chilling. I'm not going. I'm the only one. Now they've got some very interesting char char characters. Uh, one of them is actually there's a Ugandan influencer called Susan Mutesi. Right, Susan Mutesi, and she recently caused a scandal because she's based in Australia. And she was accused of buying 100,000 followers on Instagram. So she had fake followers to boost her popularity. And they're criticizing a lot. A lot of people are very angry. A lot of Western countries are saying this is totally unacceptable. Well, wait till you hear about Ugandan elections. <laughs> if you're bothered by what the influencer is doing, I don't think you want to know what Museveni is doing. <laughs> And then another interesting thing about Uganda is currently, and this is not a competition, but currently it seems like Uganda is the worst country in the world to be gay, right? Uh, because in 2014, uh, they introduced a new law against aggravated homosexuality, right? The only thing which confuses me about this is the word aggravated what does aggravated mean like does it mean like oh they're kissing it's fine but then like oh they're kissing and he grabbed his hair arrest them <laughs> right it's very weird aggravated homosexuality it's very troubling very horrible a lot of things which have been said and done um but also like i was thinking like wait they want to stop people being homosexual and what they do is arrest them and lock them up with people of the same sex I don't think they've thought this out, but the more troubling thing is there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of Western condemnation of Uganda for this. But if you look at Uganda historically, before the colonials came, it was okay to be gay. There was a chief who was gay, people just rocking gay, people just like, yo, it was just love. And then the British colonies came and they, they spread Christianity, but also like a lot of condemnation, and it worked. Yeah. And then now they're like, we don't like homosexuality, and now like all the Western countries have moved on, and they're saying, you're bad, Uganda. It's like, we well, were just doing what you told us to do. <laughs> Not funny, but a good point, okay. <laughs> E 
Egypt. Egypt. Now, Egypt is interesting because it's one of the, the countries which you actually learn about in school. Right? People talk about Egypt, but a lot of people act like Egypt isn't in Africa. Like they literally did a movie about Cleopatra, and it was a white woman, and everything was white, right? And it's a very interesting thing in that we, we, we gained a lot from the Egyptians. We, we learned the math, science. We use so many things from the Egyptians, but we never use triangular houses. <laughs> Why is that the one thing that didn't stick? You know what I mean? Like, I would like to build a mansion in pyramid style. <laughs> but it's also interesting in that you get this thing where people not only think that Egypt's not in Africa, but th when they find out it's from Africa, they question all of their accomplishments. I mean, for example, people believe that aliens built the pyramids. Wow. It's more believable to them that green men from Mars came and built Martians in a bunch of ignorant Africans is, is, is very, very troubling. Now, I will say uh, that a, a lot of things that people don't know about Egypt is there was actually a big wave of feminism, big wave of feminism in the 1900s. Uh, there was a woman called Doraya, Doraya, and she, it's, it's actually kind of sad because the things which she was campaigning for in 1900 are equal education, abolition of the veil, and to raise the age of marriage to 16. The same things people are fighting for now. <laughs> like, like literally, couldn't we have moved the dial a little bit? No, it's the same things, it's the same things. But it's a, a, a beautiful country, beautiful country. Madagascar, ladies and gentlemen, Madagascar. Now, Madagascar is a beautiful country, it's an island, but it has one of the most odd traditions. Now, they are trying to stamp it out because it was spreading disease, so I'm not sure if it still exists, but for a long time, they had the Dead People Festival, okay? So what you would do is you would bring your ancestors out of their tombs, yeah, rewrap them, write names on their cloths to remember them, and dance while carrying the corpses through the streets. Now, my initial thought was what you're thinking, like, oh my God, that's horrific, that's horrible. But the more I thought about it, I was like, you know, that's kind of a cool way to be remembered. You know what I mean? <laughs> every, every year, your family brings up your corpse and they dance, and I actually think I'm gonna put that in the will now. Like, if you want any of my money every few years, you got to bring me out and just be like, yo, Denise, you're in the house! <laughs> but it's also interesting that, wow. you know, you start thinking about how you'll be remembered yeah. as you get older, right? Like, like I, I had a very bizarre conversation with my dad. So my, so my dad sat all of the chapondas around, sat us all around, and was giving us advice, and he was, he was, he was saying things like, so he's got a bunch of properties which he's going to give us. But he wants it to be his legacy. So he's like, if you sell it, we will haunt you. <laughs> he wants it to be like a Malawian legacy. And it's also really nice because he's tried to sort of reach out to me because, uh, you know, we argued a lot about me being a comedian, right? And now he's like, okay, this is a comedian. Now he's quite a happy, they're billboards. Ah. But at the same time, my dad's someone who shows love by giving advice. I don't know if you know people like that. They'll, they'll never say anything touching, but they will always have advice. That's their way. So he was like, okay, I must give him advice about being a comedian. So he went online and he Googled. Oh, wow. And he had people ask, who's a great comedian? And someone told him the greatest was Richard Pryor. So my dad watches Richard Pryor, takes notes. Oh, no. Then someone tells him, Robin Williams. So it's just Robin Williams, he writes notes. And then he's like, ah, these are Americans. I need a Brit. I need a British person. Someone told him, oh, there's a British comedian, Russell Brand. So he watches nice. Russell Brand. He takes notes. And then my dad sits me down and I've watched three great comedians. I have advice for you to become super famous. Start doing drugs now. <laughs> but it's tough when you have to start thinking about your parents' mortality, right? Like my dad even like had a very honest conversation with us. He was like, uh, essentially, he takes blood pressure medicine. And there was one time last year 
his blood pressure was, he was feeling really bad. He took the medicine and the blood pressure didn't go down. And he waited, it didn't go down. And he was like, this is it. Like, this is me going. So he went from the second floor of the house to the first floor of the house to make it easy for him to carry people. So he went from the second floor of the house to the first floor of the house to make it easy for people to carry him out. And I'm like, that's so considerate. Like, if I'm dying, I'm going to the, the roof. <laughs> I'm not making it easy for any of you. <laughs> Next up, we've got Congo. Ooh. Now, Congo, it was really hard for me to write jokes about because both of the Congos have just got a rough history, like decades and decades of conflict. Yeah. However, the conflict was so bad that sometimes there would be conflict spillover into Sudan and Uganda. So the fight and it would spill over. And I'm like, that's the bad neighbor. That's the horrible neighbor. Could you imagine your neighbors having a fight with his wife, like screaming, and suddenly they're in your kitchen <laughs> <laughs> throwing stuff at each other, saying, I'll never forgive you. They start bawling on the floor. Guys, it was so depressing. That was the best I could do, man. That was the best I could do. But you know, there's actually nothing you can do. Uh, now, now in England, Congo is known for umbongo, mm. which is a, a drink called umbongo in the Congo. But um, you know, Congo's got so much stuff. They've got diamonds. Yeah. Right? They've got uh, coltan, which is now computers. And this is why it's even more depressing that there's so much poverty there, right? Because they've got they've got mines. But maybe that's why it's called Minds, not Ours. Next <laughs> <laughs> up is a country which I've been to, but I remember vaguely, which is Somalia. Because I went to Somalia when I was four, five, and six. I remember little things like how to count. It's the one thing you remember, that and, and swearing. Like, literally, that's all you, all you can ever remember about all the different countries you go to. But I remember, it's interesting the things you remember as a kid, what stands out as a, a, a country. Now, part of the reason I'm stressing this is on TikTok, Somalians believe that I am pretending that I was in Somalia. Because I posted a joke about Somalia and everyone was like, there was never an international school in Somalia. There was never an American school. This guy's lying. And I think it's because when there was a war, people like forget everything that there was before. Like when I lived there, it was amazing. Like, and it was actually a place which people, uh, Ethiopian refugees were running to. But I remember being on flat roofs because it was so hot that what you would do is, uh, we didn't have air conditioning, so our air conditioning was sleeping on the roof. And as a kid, this was the coolest thing ever. It was like camping every day. It was absolutely amazing. But I also remember being robbed. Right? I remember being robbed. And our car parked, and I was sitting there waiting for my parents, and a hand went in through the window and grabbed my bag, and they ran. And like the guy was running like an Olympic hurdler. He was jumping over things. People were, were, were chasing him, and he was like, you know, uh, Tom Cruise, he was just faster than everyone, jumping on things, doing capoeira tricks. Goes there, and I actually feel bad for him nowadays, because I'm like, this guy risked being arrested, got home, and I was like, what have I got? And it's a little kid's bag with like a peanut butter sandwich <laughs> and Dr. Seuss. <laughs> and he's like, no! <laughs> Hello again, Denise are here with an ad break, advertising myself. Please, if you've enjoyed this free entertainment, consider going over to either Amazon or Next Up, or I'm on many platforms, ITVX, and watching the specials I actually get paid for. Uh, so just put in Delisa Chaponda, Amazon, or Next Up, and ITVX, and you'll find there's one different special on each of those. So check those out. Now Togo is a very interesting country. Now it, it, it used to be called part of the slave coast, which tells you how little guilt 
that colonials had about the fact that they were involved in the slave trade. They named it the slave coast. That's pride. Like, I don't call my computer the porn machine. <laughs> Even though realistically, that is what it spends most of its time involved in. <laughs> but they were totally shameless. They called it the slave coast, and the, there was ivory coast. They literally named Africa like Isles in the supermarkets. It's like, this is what we buy here, this is what we buy here. It's absolutely ridiculous. Now, the former president, right, Eadama Nasibe, I may have mispronounced his name, but he was president for 38 years. And then he left and he passed it on to his son, right? And I just think it must be really weird joining the family business when the family business is dictatorship. <laughs> Did his father train him? Did he be like, oh, take your son to school day, like take him downstairs, like, this is where we torture dissidents. <laughs> Uh, but they also had, very notably, in an environmental consciousness, they had a national action plan to reduce air pollutants. Now, this may be familiar to some people in Malawi because my father got somehow, people decided that my father was trying to ban farting when he said, we're going to reduce air pollutants. I do not know if anyone in I forgot the country. In Togo has had the same problem. However, I'm going to give you guys a treat. I'm going to tell you a story which nobody knows here. Actually, that fart story ended up saving me, right? Ended up getting me on Britain's Got Talent. So when I auditioned for Britain's Got Talent, it's a show which lots of people watch, their kids involved, so they don't want any contestant involved in any scandals, right? So they like me, they meet me, I'm sitting with their press people. And they're like, oh, you're great. They're asking me questions. And then one of them's like, what the hell is this? And they're like, in Malawi, at the same time I'm doing BGT, my father's under arrest. And then his office is on fire. And then there's all kinds of scandal stuff. And they're like, I, 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 don't, uh, I don't think we can have this guy. I don't think this is have this guy. And then one of the ladies in the press office went, wait! <laughs> his father also tried to ban farting! <laughs> and they're like, what? They said, yeah! And they're like, you know what? If we tell the Sun and the Daily Mail about the farting story, they're not going to care about some African corruption trial. It's going to be every headline. So literally, the only reason I managed to do the rest of Brains Got Talent was because of the farting story. <laughs> Next country we have is Mozambique. Do we have any Mozambicans in the house? No. Now Mozambique is the only country in the world which has a machine gun on its flag. It's, it's like, the, the, like we mean business. Yeah. We mean business. Now they say that it's just for defense, but still they mean business. Yeah. But when I actually think about it, they don't shoot loads of people. They should trade flags with America. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> if anyone should have a gun and a missile and then a picture of someone stealing your oil. That should be <laughs> the American flag. But it's, it's a very interesting country. Now, th there's something I'm, I have to talk about which uh, gives me a lot of concern. In 2017, in Mozambique, there was a lot of demand for bald-headed men. No. Yeah. Yes. Because Apparently, the bones of bald-headed men were being used in witchcraft. Because apparently, our bones... Exactly! Our bones give good luck, right? And I, 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 I'm not going to... I'm, not, I, I'm, I'm, definitely, I'm definitely not going to Mozambique. But also, if I was in Mozambique while it was going on, I would be asking women, like, where do you get the weave? Where? <laughs> <laughs> Can I get Brazilian as well? Come on! Come on! And if there were none, I'd be like, I need to have my hair grow really fast. I should probably go and see a witch doctor. <laughs> what were you saying? Have you been, have you been there or, or were you just discussing the boldness? Um, I thought you were going to say that that's what you put on your Tinder profile. Your bones give you good luck. Is that, that's what oh. I... Oh. 
this lady is very funny. If you didn't hear, if you didn't hear, she said that uh, what I put on my Tinder profile should be my bones give good luck. I like it. I will tell you something about Tinder. This isn't part of the show, but literally, when I'm in the UK, I'm swiping like crazy, right? And maybe after an hour, I get one match, okay? And then I come to Africa, and I match with everyone. Like literally, I'm actually, I don't know why I live there. It's actually crazy. I literally show up and I'm just like, ah, oh, over here, what people are looking for. But then I have to prove I'm me. They think I'm catfishing. Women like, are you really, are you really him? I'm like, yes, I'm him. Like, and one woman was like, take a selfie of yourself with a finger up to prove that it's you. I was like, wow. 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 If I was going to catfish, I'd pretend to be someone else. But anyway, so the Lakuta tribe, you've got to kidnap your girlfriend. This is like playing Tinder on hard mode, okay? You don't swipe right, you swipe your wife. And now we've got Burkina Faso. Has anyone been to Burkina Faso? Now men, you all should have big, been big fans of Burkina Faso because apparently Burkina Faso exports cotton to Victoria's Secret. And they treat it to be extra soft, right? And they make all the lingerie out of it. But I wonder if it really is extra soft. Because I had an ex who used to wear Victoria's Secret and I found it wasn't soft. It was very hard to get her to take them off. <laughs> and 19% of children in Burkina Faso have left school before the age of 11. So 19% or as the kids who've left school say, half. <laughs> that joke was for me. <laughs> First up, ladies and gentlemen, we have got Burundi. We've got Burundi. Got to talk about Burundi. Now, very interesting fact about Burundi. You giggled at Burundi. Have you been to Burundi? Did you have a dirty memory of Burundi? You just like the idea of Burundi. That was a Burundi. That was a flashback. I said Burundi, and she went, oh. So maybe you've not been to Burundi, but Burundi has been to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, Burundi, I got to say, 2014, they banned jogging. What? They banned groups of people jogging. And when I heard this, I was like, this is the place for me to go. <laughs> Everybody is fat like me. But actually, it's very interesting because they had a culture in which jogging groups of people was a form of protest. Oh. Right? And what this is, is it started in around 1993 when soldiers would run through the streets singing and intimidating their opponents and they'd be singing and running and that was what they did so then people who were all like you know protesters they all literally started running through the streets that was how they were demonstrating and that was the burundi way to show that you disapproved of the government and so the government said no more jogging now i've got a question here like clap your hands if you've been to a protest in the last like year or two it's a young, it's a young, it's a young man's game. It's a young man's game. Big walk. No, like no, like a demonstration with picket signs. Because this is what I'm saying. If it's 20 year olds that are doing this, right? Like when I was 20, I was protesting the Iraq War. I was protesting. I was. I had beliefs, right? Now I've got beliefs. But I wake up in the morning. I look outside. It's cold. I'm like ah. <laughs> I'll just donate money. Like literally, like there was a protest for environmentalism and I looked outside, I was like, I'll go when it's warm. I'll go when it's warm. <laughs> but more power to you if you're watching, if you go to, to, to protest because, you know, you got to do it. Do it on my behalf. <laughs> I'll tell you the interesting thing about Libya. Libya has got Gaddafi. So Gaddafi was president of Libya, and he's very confusing. 
for depending on what you hear about him, he's either one of the craziest, horrible dictators ever, or like the greatest African leader there's ever been. And it's almost like he was like the Incredible Hulk. Like he had two personalities, and he would like flash, and then now he's evil Gaddafi, now he's good Gaddafi. And so I made a list, I made two lists of the things which say he's crazy, and the things which say he's great. And we can decide which one he is, okay? So number one, okay, he had a pool of sharks. He had a pool of sharks. And if you irritated him, you might end up in the pool of sharks. We had crocodiles! Malawi did crocodiles! <laughs> Because we're not near an ocean. You, you, um, yeah. We raise your shark with crocodile. <laughs> so is that on the evil or the good, 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 good one? Evil. evil, evil, okay. And then he renegotiated foreign oil prices and put oil money directly into the accounts of all of his citizens. Wow. That's, that's a hero. That's a hero. I can tell you. We want that in Malawi. I can tell you, whenever they start doing plutonium or uranium, it's not going into our accounts. It's not going to our accounts. And then, right, he, any wannabe farmer would get free land and farm equipment. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. We're, we're on that side. We're, that's all good. That's all good. Now, he suppressed opposition. It sounds like Malawi too. It sounds like Malawi too. I mean... I may be in the wrong I may be in the wrong country for the good versus evil, but for you guys play along, you guys play along. Okay? Also he supported bloodthirsty regimes such as Idi Amin's regime. Sounds like America. Sounds like America. Oh. It sounds exactly like America, but we're putting him on that one. But then he also financed people like Mandela and other freedom fighters. So he was just giving his money to everyone. He was just making it rain to all the African leaders. But like, I don't care if you're good or evil. I got the money, I got the money. Let's go, let's go, let's go. <laughs> then he had Amazon supermodel bodyguards. Yes, the female guards. The female sexy guards. Is this good, good or evil? This is good. This is empowering. Okay, so that's em empowering. You, that's good to hear because I just want you all to know that if, if ever I am president of Malawi, yeah. the supermodel bodyguards are coming, man. The supermodel bodyguards are, are just chilling, man. It's going to be great. It's going to be great. Yes, you're, you're ready. She's, she's ready. You're, yeah. The ladies. <laughs> Some, Q, Q will, will shoot me. He's got a gun. He's, he's there. He calls himself King of Kings. This is dodgy, no? Yeah. He called himself King of Kings. Um, he paid for education and all medicine was free for his citizens. Wow. Okay, so overall, where do we put him? Where do we put Gaddafi? On the good or the evil? Good? good. 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 Evil? Good. We're not sure. Yeah. It's complicated. It's complicated because they're, they're like, they're, they're a lot of leaders have very complicated legacies. Like, like even Malawi, like we had... We had the, he, he liberated us from the colonials, but then like my family had to run away. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? There's, there's, it's, and I think the world is bad at recognizing that people have good and evil in them yeah. now. People want it to be all good or all yeah. evil. Like, yeah. clap your hands in the audience if you're still listening to R. Kelly. No, 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 you're not listening, you're not listening. The person was good, the person was bad. The person was bad. You can't even think it. So beep, beep. I believe I can fly. I believe I can fly. Wow. I'm impressed in you, but like, like uh, it's difficult. Okay, like, okay, here's another one. Clap your hands if you still listen to, no, clap your hands if you thought Michael Jackson was guilty. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now, do you still listen to the music? It's harder to let go of, right? You can leave remix to ignition, but remember the time? Man in the mirror? Well, I'm a comedian. I'll tell you the one which broke my heart. It wasn't actually any of those. It was a comedian, comedian Bill Cosby. Because he inspired me, right? He was one of the positive black people on, on, on television. And also, any time that anyone said the N-word, he'd say it's unacceptable. Little did we know, the N-word he hated was no. Oh. That joke is very cl clever. Don't listen to these people booing. Yeah. Nobody was hurt in that joke. 
so all I'm saying is that people like Gaddafi are complicated. Yes. Yes. And if I'm ever an African leader, remember, I'll be good for the economy, but strippers, stripper body. <laughs>
a, a, a title which people find respectful, but the son perform um, what is called gift economy. And I came across the gift economy in the UK. I didn't know what it was. So I came downstairs, outside my flat, there's a beggar. Okay, he knows who I am, he says hello every now and then. And he was there and he was like dozing off. And another beggar came and kicked him and said, stop sleeping on the job. <laughs> How can you, like, if there's any job where you should be able to sleep in the middle of the day, it's begging, right? And so, like, when his friend was gone, I went up to him and said, what that was out of order? Why is the guy kicking you? And he said, no, well, actually, we made a deal, right? It's very hard begging now, especially now with the financial problems of the UK. So sometimes you're lucky, sometimes you're not unlucky. So I beg over here. He goes and begs in South Manchester. And then at the end of the day, we meet, and we put our money together, and we split it. So if I'm lucky today, I help him. If he's lucky tomorrow, he helps me. And this is called a gift economy, and it's practiced by the San, right? What they do is like, I'll go hunting in the north, you go hunting in the south, and then when you meet in the middle, you split, right? And I think we need to bring back the gift economy, okay? Particularly with comedians, because I've got friends like Trevor Noah, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I think, come on, like, I'll go earn. He goes earn, we put it in the middle, and we split it 50-50. <laughs> All of my facts are from encyclopedias, they're from newspapers, and I know sometimes there's some inaccuracies in how Africa is portrayed. So if you are from one of the countries which I tell jokes about and I've made an error, put it in the chat and I will update.